Well, there's no doubt about it. Hosea, the prophet in the Bible, was a contemporary of Isaiah. Now, what does that mean? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Henry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. Thank you for joining us as we study Hosea chapter one. We're gonna do that in about five minutes time. It's gonna be a very interesting study and uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But Corey is here with Ryan. Corey? Today, I'm taking a look at one of the kings of Judah that's mentioned in the scripture today. Ryan? Was it right for Hosea to marry a prostitute? And was it right for God to command Hosea to do that? Well, these are the questions that I'm going to be dealing with today on the program. That's a really interesting question because, I mean, you know, God says, you know, you got to be keep yourself pure. But then he tells his prophet to marry a prostitute. Very interesting. Janice? Our life is a testimony. All right, take your Bible guide. If you don't have a Bible guide, stay there. We'll tell you how you can get one. In the meantime, let's open up the Bible and listen to what God is saying. Hosea 1, 1 through 9. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu, and will bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, Call her name Lo-Ruhamah, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. Now when she had weaned Lo-Ruhamah, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, Call his name Lo-Am-I, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Hosea 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is the beginning of the minor prophets. Now, it's not minor because of their importance, but it's minor because of their content. Now, very little is known about the man Hosea. However, we do know that he was called by God in the time of the great prophet Isaiah. And the list of the kings of Judah mentioned in the opening verse of the Bible Rather, the opening verse of Hosea tells us that his ministry covered at least 40 years. It ended sometime during the reign of Hezekiah. Most of Hosea's messages were directed at the northern kingdom of Israel. But southern kingdom of Judah was also not overlooked. Hosea was called by God to go beyond what's normal. Many times we have things in our mind that God has called us to, but has he ever called you to do something that's not normal or seems out of place? God called Hosea to marry a promiscuous woman. His marriage to Gomer seemed to set up Luz from the start and brought him much heartache. God would demonstrate how the people of Israel were like a wayward wife. God had made a covenant with them, but they broke that covenant. This book is a hard book of judgment and salvation. And this is a time in Hosea's life when things are not always good because a time in the 
life of Israel as a nation are not good, even though they're very successful financially. Very interesting. Take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can call us or you can write to us or you can go to Bible Discovery TV. Don't forget the TV, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you go there, click on the Bible guide page and when you click on that page, it'll take you to a donate section. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate your donation and may God help you and bless you with that. And then it takes you to a place where you can download it. So you're seconds away from joining us when we talk about judgment and salvation. A very interesting read. Let's pray. Father, help us today as we begin the journey through Hosea. Help us to learn what you have said through your prophet. We thank you, Lord, and we love you for everything you're doing, but we need to hear from you today. So teach us your way and show us your path in the name of Jesus Christ. And we all said together, amen and amen. Hosea chapter one is very, very interesting. It says the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Berai in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. What does this mean? Hosea was a contemporary of Isaiah. Do you remember Isaiah's book? That big, long book? God often speaks to us about following his ways and not following our own ways. Now, keep this in mind. Isaiah was unique. Hosea is unique. And God often calls us to be in parallel times like many people in ministry are in right now and today doing different things. We don't do everything. Not everybody does everything. And somebody said to me recently, well, what's going to happen now that Billy Graham's gone? And I said, well, God is, has his people everywhere. Billy Graham was just a man, a great man, but he was just a man, just like I am, just like you are. And God uses men to communicate his Holy Spirit, which is divine. That's important. The Holy Spirit is still here. Even though many heroes are gone, the Holy Spirit is still here. Very interesting. Hosea chapter one, verse two says this. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. That brings me to this point. God calls Hosea to live out the prophecy, not just speak about it. Live it out, Hosea. Beloved, we must live our lives for Jesus Christ, not simply talk about it. I saw a shirt one time. It was great. It was a shirt. It said, uh, spread the gospel to everybody. And at the bottom in small letters, it said, and if necessary, use words. That's a great shirt. You see, we need to live God's principles in our life. We need to activate God's principles in our life by living that way. So very important, beloved. If, if we don't, if we talk about it all the time, but we don't live it, that's a problem. But if we live it and don't talk about it, let me tell you something. Actions are louder than words. Now, our media doesn't like that. But that is the truth. Actions are louder than words. Very important for us to remember. Well, let's read on because this gets very interesting now. We go to three verse, verse three through nine. And so he went out and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And then the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. For in a little while, I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. And then God said to Hosea, call her name Lo Rahumah, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them 
by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses or horsemen. Now, when she had weaned lo Rahama, she conceived and bore a son. And then God said, call his name lo am I, for you are not my people. Very carefully, listen to this. And I will not be your God. Oh my goodness. That is intense. God spoke through Hosea's marriage. He spoke through Hosea's family. And God has examples in our own lives and families to demonstrate who he is to all. Beloved, listen to me carefully. We are all called. Everyone is called. God sets the solitude in families. So our families are called. And there's a reason why the enemy is targeting our families and going after our families. Kill marriage, kill mothers, kill fathers, just wipe them out. That's because God has designed them. The Lord Almighty has designed the family to give an example of who he is. The enemy today would like to just destroy it all. Father, I pray today that the enemy would not have success in destroying the family. Thank you, Lord. Not easy, but it's good. Because we, our marriages, our families, are examples of God's remarkable provision and unbelievable mercy and grace. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for helping our families. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we all said together, amen. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. So right away in the book of Hosea, Hosea sets us up to know that he is a contemporary of Isaiah the prophet. So Isaiah and Hosea open up pretty identically by saying that they prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now Hosea also mentions that uh, this was during the reign of Jeroboam in northern Israel. And this, of course, is Jeroboam II, who has a really fascinating reign, a very long reign um, that we'll go into at a later date because today I want to focus in on that first king that Hosea and Isaiah mention, King Uzziah. King Uzziah is called by two names in the Bible, Azariah in 2 Kings and Uzziah in 2 Chronicles. Uzziah began his reign when he was 16 years old and managed to keep the throne until his death 52 years later. This was in breaking with recent family tradition. Both his father Amaziah and his grandfather Jehoash were murdered by some of their own officials. Uzziah ruled Judah and Jerusalem in a sort of golden age of peace for the area. Both Judah and northern Israel benefited from the empire of Assyria being preoccupied with other nations to the north of them. Israel and Judah were also at a temporary peace with one another, and so King Uzziah had much time to expand his nation. The Bible gives him credit for great warfare, taking and rebuilding Eloth in the territory of Edom taking three Philistinian cities and building his own cities in their territories, and turning the Ammonite people into vassals of Judah. Credit is also given him for being industrious. He built fortified towers on the walls of Jerusalem, built military towers in the desert, and made use of war machines said to be placed in the towers to shoot arrows and large stones. Uzziah also reorganized Judah's military and supplied them with armor and equipment. Apart from military concerns, King Uzziah is said to have loved the soil, commissioning farmers and vine dressers in the mountainous areas of Judah and digging many new wells for his large amounts of herd animals. All of this taken together apparently made him famous as far as the entrance to Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. 
Well, it was this strength that would corrupt Uzziah's motivations. His life has left an archaeological record seal impressions that mention him by name have been found. They originally belonged to two of his court officials. A gravestone warning people of Uzziah's leprosy has also been found. Though dated to a later time than his, it's believed that his bones were moved from his original tomb, and the ominous gravestone marked their new resting place. I hope that gives you a little bit of context. I know it's just one of the kings that Hosea mentions, but it's really helpful, I think, to understand what's going on politically, socially, and economically in Israel and Judah at the time period of these prophets, because these were the lives that they were living. These are the influences that were on them. This is their context. So understanding these visions that God gave them in their original context is really, really helpful. Understanding those cultural and political pull, pulling and pushing that's going on on the nation and them uh, really gives a little bit more insight to what God is saying to the people at that time. I see it's really important for us to understand that the technology uh, in the sense of what they did and how they did it was really advanced. Uh, it's not like they had, you know, AI and all that stuff, but they had ways of developing and using what they had. It's very, yeah, very, very interesting. practical. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, Ryan. All right, so our reading today is Hosea chapters 1 to 4, and this has to be one of the most controversial passages in the entire Bible. And that's because, as we've been talking about, God commands his prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute. Now, this, of course, raises some questions and concerns and is offensive to a lot of Bible readers. I mean, why would God break his own law by asking Hosea to do such a thing? Well, actually, he didn't break his own law. Check it out. It's no secret that the Bible contains many strange and shocking things, and God's command to the prophet Hosea is no exception. In fact, in Hosea's inaugural vision from the Lord, God commands him, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So Hosea went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, as wife, and she bore three children. This highly controversial portion of scripture clearly raises some questions and concerns. Mostly, how could a holy and righteous God break his own law by ordering Hosea to first of all marry a prostitute, and secondly, by doing so, commit adultery? Various scholars have proposed various solutions. For example, some prefer not to take this passage literally, but instead allegorically, meaning Gomer wasn't really a physical prostitute at all, only a spiritual one. However, others preferring to take the text literally suggest that Gomer became a harlot only after she had married Hosea. In this scenario, the Lord was commanding the prophet to marry a woman who God knew would be promiscuous later. Still, other scholars have no issue in taking the text both literally and at face value, pointing out that even if Gomer was a harlot previous to her marriage to Hosea, there is no problem, since none of God's laws were being violated in the first place. First of all, according to Leviticus chapter 21, verses 7 and 14, it was only unlawful for a priest to marry a harlot. And secondly, Hosea did not commit adultery by marrying a harlot, because she was an unmarried woman. It is an unusual command to be sure, but it does not require Hosea to commit adultery, nor does it endorse the past or future adultery of Gomer. Even when Gomer is unfaithful to Hosea, God commands Hosea to love her and take her back. And that is exactly the point. Hosea's unhappy marriage was intended by God to serve as a heartrending illustration of the relationship between God and Israel. Though Israel, like Gomer, committed great harlotry by serving other gods, God still loved her and will take her back. So I really don't think that this portion of scripture needs any special explanation. I know this passage can be offensive and shocking, but isn't that exactly the point? Gomer and Israel's sin was offensive to God, and yet in their unfaithfulness, God remained faithful. It's the same with us. God is offended by our sin and unfaithfulness, and yet in his mercy, he remains faithful and forgives our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ for those of us who repent and trust in Christ. Of course, this doesn't give us an excuse to keep on sinning. Jesus lived a perfect life and died to pay for our sins, but God expects us to live a life pleasing to him. 
As Paul the Apostle says in Romans 12, 1 to 3, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, this doesn't mean that we'll never sin, because as Paul also says, all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. But what it does mean is that we don't walk in or practice those sins anymore. It's a new day. I, I think this is important to say because a lot of people will say, I'm a Christian, I just do what I want, and God has to love me. Mm. Uh, and they miss the whole point mm -hmm. uh, that when we come to Christ, our desire is not to sin. Yeah. Our desire is to become a new person. That's right. And yeah. when that's our desire, then God helps us with the power of his Holy that, Spirit. That's the repentant, the repentance that we need to have. And a lot yeah. of people, when they come, they don't have that repentance and, and you end up with false conversions. But, you know, that repentance is key, that, that heart, that, you know, living sacrifice sort of heart. So, you know, it's not that, you know, you, you're trying to find an experience. You're trying to, you realize you've come to the end and you got a big, serious problem and you're coming to the confrontation of that problem. That's right. Exactly. And only Jesus Christ can deal with that. So he's as close as the mention of his name. You should call on him today. Janice? Well, that's exactly what I was going to talk about. Our life is a testimony because, because it is. And where it's a wonderful thing, it's also a very daunting thing. Because like Ryan so well pointed out, that we, when we accept Christ into our hearts and we we choose to follow him with our lives, we turn away from sin, but we are imperfect and we are going to make decisions that are wrong. And we need to live in that repentant state, not as you, as you pointed out, Rod, that we don't live to say, oh, well, we can live how we want and God, God, God will forgive me, God will love me, kind of like that genie in a bottle. You know, some people think of God in that way. Well, I just go to God if I get in trouble or if I need something, I just pray. And, and that, that, that is so sad. That's such a sad relationship or a sad way to think about who God is. This is the God of the universe who designed you uniquely with giftings that he has put in you with a purpose for your life. This is the God that we serve. This is a God who sent his son to pay for our sins so that if we would choose to accept him and turn away from sin and be reconciled to him, our lives have that purpose. We can now begin to walk in that life. And yes, we're going to make mistakes. No, we're not perfect. And if we act and talk like we're perfect and that we're somehow up here and the rest of the world is down here, then we've missed the point again. Because the same grace that God extended to us, God extends to others. And we need to have that same grace to extend to others. And we need to not be worried about how somebody else is living as much as we need to be concerned with how we're living first and foremost. Foremost, It's that speck in your brother's eye, Rod. I can't be telling you about how bad you're living and how bad you're acting when the scripture says that you, I'm trying to get a speck out of your eye when I have this great big chunk of wood in my own. I need to, I need to have that personal relationship with God so that I can live a life that is a reflection of who he is to the people that live around me. Because you see, we live in a world, especially right now, don't we? Where there's so much confusion, there's so much darkness, there's so many people, even in, in Christians, even in churches today, that are doubting the authority of God's word, that are doubting that Jesus, the only son of God came and gave his life to atone for our sins. They're doubting that. Boy, we need to take a serious look inside church. People who say, I'm a Christian, we need to take a serious look at where our hearts are. And we need to start that today because our lives are a testimony and a reflection and we are accountable. You know, I can, I can talk about my dad. I can talk about the things because you know what? My dad lives with us. We love 
my dad, my kids, that's your papa. And we know the things that papa likes to do. We know the things that papa doesn't like to know. And you know what? If, if we were to listen to somebody who doesn't know papa or my dad, and they were to say something odd, we could say, oh, well, that doesn't sound like my dad. Or, well, no, actually, my dad doesn't like cucumbers. He, he, he doesn't like cucumbers. It's because we have a relationship with him. And it's the same thing with God. This is a God who asked Hosea to do something that broke Hosea's heart. Hosea lived out a life, you know, he literally pointed ahead to God's love perfectly expressed in Christ. Christ, who bought the freedom of his bride, the church, with his own life. That's what Hosea displayed. What do we display with our life when we say we're a Christian? when we're a follower of Christ, boy, we need to know what his word says, but not just what it says. We need to live it. We need to speak it. We need to be a reflection, the light and the salt in this world. That's who we're called to be. Let's be a wonderful reflection. Let's have a good testimony. A testimony, the evidence or proof provided by the existence or appearance of something. Well, I'd like you to join us on Rumble. We have a, it's a social media service and we have a live stream there that we put all nine of our programs on and uh, we try to get them in there and we do a lot of work here and we trust the Lord. And so join us on Rumble. You can see our program, but you can also watch the live stream if you want. Today, let's pray. Lord, I want to bring people to you. Help me to live in such a way in my family and in my life to do that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.